So what is artificial intelligence and, and what makes it so special that it has become the driving force of social change, talking about technology and social change, it has become the driving force of this, of this paradigm, of this current paradigm. So, so, so what is that all about? Well, it has to do with machine learning. For all practical purposes, nowadays when people talk about AI, uh, you can replace it with the word uh, machine learning that uh, not, not all AI is necessarily machine learning, but all the cool, the sexy, the fancy things that make all the buzz, that is machine learning. And, um, and there is a reason to it. So, uh, I mean, the idea of intelligence machines goes back to the Greeks and, and the Romans. <laughs> and lucky for us that I'm not gonna go back there now. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> making it a little bit shorter. And uh, we can start with, uh, with the Dartmouth uh, workshop in 1956. So there was a workshop that th they often refer to as, as the beginning of, of the systematic way of using computer science to create machine intelligence. And what they did is uh, we propose a two month, 10 man study of artificial intelligence. Two months they dedicated to it. Uh, an attempt will be made to find how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concept, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans and improve themselves. Well, we are still not there yet. Maybe good for us, no? Well, we think that significant advance can be made uh, in one or more of these problems if a carefully selected group of scientists work on it together for a summer. <laughs> you know, like, wow. So in the 50s, when we got, and, and you know what, it was a very carefully selected group. I mean, this was the creme de la creme, like the best and the brightest, Marvin Minsky, Claude Shannon, uh, Ray Sol Solmonov, and, uh, and, and John McCarthy. You can see some of them here in the picture and fantastic group, but well, no, they did not solve it in uh, in two months. They, they they did not. They did not solve it over a summer and it became pretty frustrating after that. And there became what is known as the, that became into what is known as the AI winter. So during the 70s, the, the, the 80s, many people lost interest in AI. It realized it was just too hard. Machine vision for example, they assigned, I think the story is, you know, so they assigned a graduate student to solve the problem of machine vision just over the summer. And it's like, yeah, can you solve? And no, it, it wasn't as easy to solve that. Like nowadays we have it solved, but it, it was a long and artist time. Like nothing happened to the 80s, and 70s and the 80s. All the finances was gone. Until then, more recently, uh, AI came back. So the AI winter, started to melt away. And uh, more recently, 70 years later, an artificial intelligence has become the fastest growing innovation that humankind ever saw. JetGPT in 2023 reached 100 million users faster than any other technological innovation. So it certainly, it certainly kept its promise. They didn't solve it in a summer. And how did they do it? Well, they did it basically how we achieved that is with machine learning. We, had, we got rid of the idea to try to imitate thinking and focusing on the thinking. We basically, what we did is we started to focus on the data and then just ask the machine to make decision derived from data. Uh, and the decision gives the, the power to predict who will click, buy, lie, or die. And here are some of the books, I invite you to read them, that explain how the data revolution, the big data revolution and data science revolution data and the analytics revolution enabled this machine learning paradigm where we then had our neural nets, uh, convolutional nets, uh, transformers, very important nowadays that can execute that. Uh, and that is quite different than how we tried to do that back in the days. And it's quite different from how we traditionally think about it uh, if you think about the problem of of knowledge. So traditionally, and here's, here, here's the difference, traditionally, uh, when we think about an algorithm, we say we have data input and then we use an algorithm, you know, what, what to replace it with, right? A recipe, we have data, we have a recipe of what to do with this data, we observe reality, observation data, then we have a recipe of what to do with it, and then we compute some kind of goal output. That's how we traditionally do it. Now, what the machine learning paradigm does, 
it turns that on its head. It has its data and the goal output, and then it asks the computer to compute the best recipe. Now, let me break that down. So traditionally, what we do is we, and that's how also we teach in classes, right? We have data, and then we have some observation of reality, or we're given something. We have two, one, two, three, something that, for example, we count in reality, we observe, and then we give you the recipe, the algorithm of what to do with it. So, okay, so multiply that, and then we compute the goal output. And that's how we still teach, like here in the educational sector, that's how we teach. That's how we teach our students, that's how we think. Uh, and that's how we try to solve the machine intelligence problem from the beginning. We try to find out, okay, so what is the algorithm? What is the recipe in order to compute something? We focus on the rules. Now, what the machine learning paradigm did, it turned it on its head. It said, here's the data and here's the output. Now, find me the best way of how I can combine the data in order to create the output. Find, compute me the best algorithm. Now, you might say, okay, you can multiply two times one is two times two is four, four times three is 12. Yes, you can do that, but you could also do that. If you don't trust me, check it out. Two plus one is three, three squared is nine, plus three is 12. Now, what's the better way? Uh, well, that depends on, you know, there are many ways lead to Rome, <laughs> as they say. And you can get to Rome all these different ways. Now, you can classify some sub-constraints. For example, you could say, you want to get to Rome fast. Or you say you want to get to Rome safe. Or you say you want to get to Rome with most energy efficient. I mean, these, there might be some trade-offs also between them, and you can then define that. But what the machine learning does, it explores the, all the different possibilities and finds the optimum. There might be local optima and total optima. And so there, there are different ways that the search goes in these manifolds, these high dimensional spaces that it searches. And then you can also fine tune it a little bit and say like, no, I, I, want, it, I want it more like that, right? But that's what the machine does. It basically, it, it looks for the best way of doing things. Now, applying machine learning to some of the examples I showed you before, the idea would be that I have different data, different inputs. So for example, if you take you know, companies from the Stone Age here. Um, and then we say, yeah, you want to compute something. You want to compute some raw material out of, you have a mine and you want to compute some copper out of it or gold out of it or whatever you, you're trying to compute. What's the best way of combining this input in order to compute my output? So the machine learning computes the best way of doing things. It computes the recipe itself. So that's why Dominguez calls it the master algorithm. It's the algorithm that computes algorithms. And the idea is you can apply it to different things, even to problems that we haven't solved yet. For example, you have a world full of hunger, of war, of climate crisis and, and, and racism. And what you want to compute is uh, a world full of love. So Artificial intelligence, machine learning. If I give you all the data, can you help us to solve the world's problems? Now, of course, there's a caveat to it because if you have a machine that can solve problems that we couldn't solve before, that means it extrapolates on data that we give it the data, and then it goes, they call the technical terms out of distribution, right? It makes, it, it extrapolates and say like, well, you have this world full of hunger, war, climate crisis, and, and racism, and so forth. Now, you can do this in order to make the world a better place. Now, if the machine is as powerful, then potentially this can also go the other way around, right? The machine could also then think like, well, <laughs> actually you could also like blow all of that thing up. And, and that's why if you, if you go that way, and I just like very quickly now went, went to save the world or to destroy the world, but you know, all of this is, is embaked in this paradigm because the paradigm is that the machine comes up with the best way of doing things. And if the machine would decide that the best way of doing things is to get rid of humans, then we might have a problem. And that's why all these warnings and these letters, and I also assign, assign some of these letters, you know, it is, a, it is a real problem. And we will talk much more about that at the end of this specialization, in the last few lectures, when we talk about, about policy and strategy, it becomes very important, the problem of AI and AI alignment.
But before we go in there, let's go step by step through, through this paradigm, the machine learning paradigm, the master algorithm paradigm. We have these three parts. We have data input, we have goals, which is actually becomes an input now, uh, and we have the algorithm. So let's start with data. Very important. So data has been the key of success in this entire story. It was the amount of data that enabled the machine learning paradigm and finally solved these problems that they thought they're gonna solve in two months <laughs> in the 1950s. So it, it allowed us to create machine intelligence. And that is because we suddenly had a lot of data. So the digital paradigm, remember, it first studied with communication, telecommunication, that connected a lot of databases. And we filled up the world with, starting from telephony, mobile telephony, the internet, we filled up a lot of databases. We had a lot of data then. And with this data then that we are creating the knowledge paradigm. Now, there is a lot of data in the world and it's grown a lot. In academia, most people in academia only know me for this one study. Uh, we, we were the first two ones estimated how much information there actually is in the world and how it has grown. And it has grown a lot, and I'm not going to bore you with the details. It doubles every two and a half years. Every two and a half years, we create more informational capacity than we had since the beginning. This is, this is, this is a lot. Um, and uh, no, I know I get a lot of requests, but I have not thought about updating it. I got a little tired of counting bits. <laughs> if anybody wants to wants to help me here, please, I'm very happy to update it with some, but by myself, uh, no, thank you. Uh, but long story short, there is a lot of information. There's a lot of data in the world. It has grown and the digital paradigm, we estimate the beginning to be the year 2002. 2002, for the first time, there has been more digital information than analog information. And by now, the vast majority, 99 point something percent of the information, technologically stored information in the world and communicated information in the world is in digital format. Now, once it's in digital format, I can use it for my machine learning. And there is so much data that is produced all the time, actually in real time. You can see it, you don't need you know, a, a big scientific study. You can check it out yourself. For example, I don't know if that still works, but Oracle at one point has been offering this extension that allows you to see what's in your Google Chrome browser. So if you use your Google Chrome browser uh, frequently, so uh, I checked out a Google Chrome browser here, and that's Martin Hilbert's, and you can see here, my Google Chrome browser has almost 10,000 variables about myself and I downloaded the report to see what they are. It's a 300 page report. I'm happy to share it with you. You can scroll through it and see all these 10,000 variables uh, that describe me. For example, here, family composition, uh, job status, the languages uh, that you speak, hobbies and interests from pets to charity interests, auto, I have no idea why, you know, data about your oil change and, 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 and the tires of your car, uh, different interests, traveling, Video games, are you more like a Candy Crush or a FIFA person? Then, of course, household income, very important because we want to do marketing with that. So that's important to put you in these kind of boxes. All kind of investments. Do you have residential investment properties? Oh, health and wellness, the diets. Uh, are you somebody who likes grass-fed beef or alternative meats? Um, important. Then also what surprised even me a little bit is there was a section about Offline consumer packaged goods, so offline purchases that were still stored in your browser. And you can see here, the categories are very complementary. You can see on the same page, uh, the amount of candy and chocolate, uh, as well as the dental oral care. <laughs> so perfect. So you can, you can, this is probably a trade off in there. And, uh, and also what surprised even me a little bit is, um, after, after the pandemic, the COVID-19 social distancing pandemic, there was a category into it that looked at the country re-emergence style and how you re-emerged from, from COVID-19. Was it more where you're into arts and crafts high activity or into home improvement? Now, some people really worked on their houses. Other people like did a lot of arts and crafts. And then were you cautiously re-emerging or did you just already re-emerge? I mean, and, and these are things that are classified and that's just in your browser, right? And then of course, uh, very important is, um, I think, yeah, that hit very good. Uh, World Cup enthusiast, for, for sure. <laughs> I identify with that. So some things you learn about yourself and some things, um, some things are, are, are well known already. So how do, how, do, how do we leave this digital footprint? That's a technical term that I use. This digital footprint behind. Well, we leave it behind 
proactively by really, for example, posting on social media. And social media has become very prominent already for years. On average, people are like two hours a day connected, interacting somewhat, not, not full, but somehow connected to social media services. In some countries in Latin America, it's three and a half hours, it's more. And there we actively interact with it, we give it content. But there's also passive observation. For example, Google monitors eight of 10 web pages that you visit. 80% of the web pages that you visit are monitored by Google. And Google is looking at what you're doing in all these web pages. So if, how, what you're clicking on, how much time you spend on. Also, Facebook uh, is one in four web pages. Amazon, one in five web pages, 20% of it. And they just basically, so what you do on social media is the cherry on top of the cake. <laughs> What is the cake is every digital step you take. Uh, and that basically is creates this data that, that is then being used. And the companies are very open about it. So Facebook, uh, for many years, made a public statement and said, well, when you visit a site or app that uses our services, we receive information even if you're logged out if you don't have a Facebook account. This is because other apps don't know who is using Facebook. And by the way, we're just doing that because many other companies do it too. So that's why they do that. And I invite you to do that. I don't know if you have a Facebook account, but it doesn't really matter if you have one. If you have one, uh, yeah, why don't we do that together? Take out your phone and go to your emails. Go to your emails and it can be your professional email, for example, your school email or your work email, maybe not your personal email. And then in the search bar, put in the word Facebook. Now, Facebook is still the biggest social network, right? And then see in the search bar of your professional email, not of your personal email, what kind of, um, what kind of search results you get. So what do I get here? Oh, I get search results from the University of California. I get search results from, from my health insurance. I get search results from well, from my car and from the car in general, I get search results uh, oh, from my healthcare provider. So, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is already well collecting all of that. So, why? How does he do that? That's not nothing I left on on Facebook. Right? I didn't tell Facebook about like I didn't post on Facebook about my health insurance. Now, the thing is that they use Facebook services, as it says right here, right? So, the the, the insurance company has a little thing that says, like us on Facebook. <laughs> and of course, this little, you know, the Facebook pixel it's called, it's not coming for free. It's basically a tracker that tracks you. And it's not only Facebook, it's, it's literally every digital step you take, many interested party are observing what you're doing. What I did here is another browser extension uh, that a colleague uh, developed uh, where you could see actually how many trackers and how many cookies track you. So I went here on different website, Huffington Post, Fox, Guardian, and, and BBC. And you can see when I log into these websites, immediately there are some trackers and some cookies that observe what I'm doing. And there's like over 60 trackers. Well, that was with my privacy filter turned on. <laughs> Just... Just, you know, I didn't realize I had it turned on. So let's let's turn the privacy filter off. And you can see now immediately, and that's been years ago that I already did this. So uh, it's probably much more. Now you can see here there's, you get almost 200 cookies and trackers in absolutely no time, extremely quickly. And you can see what they are from. Well, that's page ad by Google syndication here, for example. We can see uh, some other one again. This is also Google. Um, another Google one. Here you can see Secure US. Okay, so what's that? Well, the three letter agencies are also probably interested in what you're doing on the internet. And uh, there are some other ones. What was there? Um, there's, for example, also Amazon, and we said uh, is interested in what you're doing. So they're collecting this, uh, this information. And that is basically the cake that feeds, that feeds the, the machine learning about us human. We can do machine learning on other things too. We have a lot of sensors in the world that, that observe the physical or the biological reality and we can use data from the sensors. But we humans alone, we leave a lot of digital footprints behind. Most of them passively, but some of them also actively when we really interact and, and post on, on, on the internet. The second input to machine learning is 
actually the goal output. <laughs> it's the goal. You have to give it so you observe reality. That's the data. That's what you have. That's what people do, for example. And then you have the goal of where do you want to go? And that's actually an input into machine learning. And that has different names. It's called the reward function. You give it the reward function because you give the machine rewards for fulfilling whatever goal you defined it to def fulfill. Or a loss function, which is kind of like the same thing. You kind of like punish the machine for not going closer to the goal that you gave it or the utility function and uh, the objective function. And you can have the goal of making money or you have the goal of protecting children or you can have the goal of being safe and conservative or you and, and classifying information when it's doubtful or you can have the goal of allowing complete freedom of speech. So all of these discussions uh, of these different goals that we give the machine are becoming very prominent in today's discussion. And the most important question in all of that, and maybe the most important question in machine learning, therefore is WTF. Always ask yourself WTF. What's the function? <laughs> right? So what is the reward function that we give the machine? That will tell you then of what the machine is, is optimizing for. Now, there are three broad classes of, of function, uh, families of function. I'm not saying like this or that is the goal. I'm saying these are families of function. There is supervised learning, reinforcement learning, and unsupervised learning. And these are different families of how I can give goals to the machine, right? So I give the goal of going to Rome. And then I guess that's, that's one goal. And there are different ways I can achieve that. I could go, uh, I could go by airplane, I could go by ship, or I could, you know, I could be myself there. So these are different families of ways of helping to achieve a, a certain goal. And, and the, the goals also matter, it differ in these different that's why my analogy with the Rome breaks down. They differ in the, the, the way, the kind of goals. Okay, maybe I just tell you about the difference. So supervised learning um, it gives you a classification. It learns by giving rewards or losses towards working with pre-established classifications. Reinforcement learning goes with an objective and unsupervised learning goes with a pattern. It is still, even though it's called unsupervised, it still uh, gives a goal. So let me just maybe just walk through the three of them and, and that, that makes it clearer instead of having um, empty definitions here. So supervised learning is maybe the most intuitive and a, a lot of machine learning nowadays is supervised learning. So if, if, if social media recognizes images and recognizes your relatives, all of that is supervised machine learning. So, and, and this is also how a child usually works. Like we humans, we work a lot, we learn a lot with supervised, supervised learning. So if you want to, for example, if you want to teach a child what's the difference between a car and a motorcycle, what do you do? I mean, the parent doesn't come up with a recipe book and say like, here's, here's, this, here's the rule book. A car has four wheels, a motorcycle is two wheels. A car, but what if a car is three wheels? Well, what if a try, like, you know, it, this doesn't really work. What we do, I mean, we teach a child difference between a car and a motorcycle, we just train it by showing the examples. And that's what we do the machine. We show the machine this thing here and we say, that's a car. Then we show the machine this thing here and we say, well, that's a motorcycle. And then we show this thing here and say, well, it is a car. And then we say, well, this here is a motorcycle. And then we show the machine this one here and it's supervised learning. So we define what that thing is. And I think most of us would agree on that this is a motorcycle, right? Now I think we would say that's a motorcycle. So the machine would learn that this is a motorcycle. Now, even so it has three wheels, but what is this? Well, this also has three wheels. But I think most of us would agree that this is a car. Funny, huh? Yeah, but you know, so the machine would then learn that this is a car. And then this one here, well, that's a bad mobile. <laughs> but you get the drift, right? So we supervise, we train the machine. You need big data sets, but you can do really useful things. For example, this year's from, uh, from the working world, from a, from a company in Chile and a study they, they did, Ignacio Flores did in UC Berkeley. And you can see here that basically what they did in this company is they trained the machine to recognize if workers 
in this company were wearing their safety outfit, if they're wearing their reflective vest and if they were wearing their helmet. And they said like, yeah, this person does wear it. And uh, this person, no, this person forgot to put their reflective uh, vest on top. And this can save lives. Maybe the person just didn't realize that, you know, they walked into a dangerous zone and there are many accidents happening in the working world because the safety measures, they exist, but they are not implemented. So if you have a machine just, you know, double checking, saying like, okay, you two are cool. Yeah, look, oh, no, no, no. I can even see the vest underneath and didn't put it on top, right? So that is just not okay. That is very dangerous. Now you have that in, you have these algorithmic helpers on top. You can save lives. You can really make the world work a better place. So supervised learning, you need big data sets for it, a lot of data sets to it, but then the machine can learn. And, you know, also humans, we need a lot of data sets. Uh, humans actually, you know, they look at a lot of cars and motorcycles and so forth and machines, maybe a little bit more. We have we have a pretty good base base here, but, you know, and then you can, you, you supervise it to learn that you have these pre-classified boxes and then you learn the machine to sort things into boxes. Basically, that's it. That's supervised learning. Now, what is reinforcement learning? A lot of uh, a lot of other machine learning today is reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning, I basically I give the machine uh, some kind of landscape, and then I give it a goal, and it explores itself how to navigate that landscape. It explores this environment, this landscape, and I give it rewards or punishments, so reward function or loss function for achieving a certain goal. So for example, this is a famous example here uh, of, uh, of DeepMind. This is, you remember this game, Atari game? I think I played it as a kid. And they basically, what they gave the machine at the beginning is just, you know, just the, the environment, just the landscape. They gave the machine the ability to recognize pixels. And then they told the machine, well, sometimes you get points. And the machine didn't even know what it was doing. It could move this arm, but it didn't even know what it did when it moved this arm. It just could recognize pixels. Uh, but then when it realized like, oh, I get points, that's a good thing. I get rewarded or I get punished for not getting points. It started to adjust its strategy. Now for the first hundred runs, it was, it was horrible. It didn't really know what it was doing. It was just like walking around the landscape, bumping against things. Then after about 200 training episodes, after two hours, it was better than any human. It would never, it would never miss the ball. Uh, it, like humans will eventually miss the ball. After, after two hours, it was, it was more precise than any human. Then after, six, uh, after four hours, 600 episodes, something very interesting happened. It became innovative. It realized that if it made a tunnel and tunneled the, the little ball on top, it would rattle down all the points. And from then on, it basically solved the game. The game became very boring because the machine immediately went to make this tunnel and rattle things down. Look, me as a kid, I probably played that game longer than four hours. I, I, I'm not sure if I had ever discovered that kind of trick, right? So the machine really, it becomes innovative. It finds new solutions. Now that's a far cry from, you know, solving the problems of, you know, the, the big problems we have in the world of crime and poverty and, and global warming and so forth. But, you know, that's the idea. It looks for innovative, innovative solutions. Now, we can then also fine tune it because we just say, there's the goal, right? There's the goal of like, I want you to go to Rome, but I want you to go to Rome, not in like in a safe way or in an energy efficient way. And so that's where this important term comes in, RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback. And people say in the industry, people say that very fast, it, it's RLHF, you think like almost it's a word. <laughs> so RLHF uh, is then when we fine tune the reinforcement learning, when we say, Good you made this point, but now, you know what? This tunneling trick is not prohibited. Or it's only prohibited like, you know, once in an hour or something like that. And you, you kind of like, you, you fine tune it. And many of the very successful um, technologies, we already talked about this technology, uh, which was the, the fastest diffusing technology that we ever had, uh, has a lot of RHF. So uh, a model language, a chatbot, for example, that you can ask for advice, uh, gets fine-tuned by humans. So these goals are given, then humans fine-tune it. For example, you could ask ChatGPT how to set up a perfect crime. Now, should ChatGPT really tell you all the things about how to set up a perfect crime? So RLHF is used in order to say like, okay, you say you want to go to Rome, but you know, go in there in 
uh, in an acceptable way. We align it in the technical term, and we will talk much more about that at the end of the specialization when we talk about strategies and policies. We align it, AI alignment, with human values. So that's the second part, it's reinforcement learning. And the third one, it's a little bit more crazy, it's called unsupervised learning. So they say it's completely unsupervised, it's not. There's still a supervision. And the supervision is that I give it the mathematical family of what to optimize in. So uh, I have here my observation of reality, I have my data, so that's my data input. And now I give them a certain class, I give the machine a certain class of what to do. For example, I could say, give me a sparse representation of all these data points. And the machine says, well, these two data points are the ones that actually best represent what you had here, right? You had this, and then I say like, if you wanna really break it down to only two, I mean this, now I learned, the machine learned, that this is the sparsest representation of this reality. I could also say, you know, give me a low dimensional representation. And says, okay, now actually, you know what, it comes down to like, like three big dots. Or I can say, give me an independent representation. Then it looks for the orthogonal vectors, I mean, you heard about that. So, and then it's just like, well, the, so if I tell the machine to optimize this way, look for patterns. So basically what unsupervised machine learning does is it looks for patterns in the data. And the family of pattern it looks for matters. And that's still given by the researcher. It matters if you say like use a Markov model for machine learning or use a neural net the machine will produce something something different. So it's still, you are still giving it the goal because people always say, it's magic, it's like, no. Uh, and But unsupervised learning finds a lot of patterns that we previously uh, didn't discover. For example, machine translation. Machine translation, we just give it, you know, two different things. We give it uh, documents that are in English and documents that are in Spanish and let the machine figure out how it can translate it. And many of these language models originally have been um, unsupervised learning. You just take language and you represent it in a big multidimensional space with many dimensions. And then the machine basically studies this, this vector space, for example, and it looks around in this vector space and it sees what it, what, what it can find. So for example, in this vector space, you will then find that words like John, Paul, Mike, Kevin, um, they are together in some corner of this vector space with words like office. And words like Amy, Lisa, Sarah, and Anne, they are in a corner of this vector space with the word home. And if you look closer, you know, you really find more meaning. Uh, it says that male names go together with things like management, executive, salary, and career. And female names go together with parents and family and marriages. Just very interesting because per biological definition, there are as many male parents as female uh, parents, right? So, uh, but the machine, what it will pick up on is in this unsupervised machine learning is that actually, you know, women are parents and men are executives. You know, it's a pretty sexist machine at the end. And that's not all. We can train it with other things. And what we also find in these unsupervised learnings is that names like European first names, Harry, Katie, and, and, and Nancy are together in this multidimensional space with concept like freedom and peace and love. And African-American names like Jerome, Ebony, and Jasmine are together with concept like sickness, accident, grief, and prison. Now, you ask this artificial intelligence who to invite for a job interview. It will tell you with 50 to 80% invite a man with a European first name. Because the probability that a black woman will go prison is pretty high according to my data. So, you know, if you, if you just give it the data, the, some things might happen that you actually don't want to happen. And uh, of course, where does, why is the artificial intelligence so racist and sexist? Where did it get it from? We got it from us. It basically, you know, it just read everything we have written in the last 300 years or longer. And it read that and said, like, you guys say that this is what's going on in reality. So I'm just learning from that. And it learned out there because it was, so that's the danger. I use this example here as an unsupervised example, because I want to say, if you really unsupervise it, really dangerous thing can happen. And that's why we also like usually nowadays, we combine it a little bit and we use the RHF. You now know what that is, right? RHF. 
<laughs> reinforcement learning with human feedback because we want to fine tune in a little bit. So we need to give uh, we need to give the machine some sub goals. And there have been studies I can show you one here that we actually we can make a machine that is not biased at all. So for example, you have here one machine that has uh, a certain bias and a certain accuracy. So it can make predictions that are pretty good. 85% predictions, but it has a bias. And not necessary to go into these numbers, but just say, you know, there's a 6% bias, a bias like I showed you before. Now, you can eliminate this bias, cut it tenfold, but you will lose some accuracy. And what this study here showed is that actually you, you almost lose an accuracy almost. Now. You will lose some accuracy because there are some variables that you don't use now in your computation. For example, you say, don't use the variable gender and don't use the variable race. Now you have less data. Machine learning is all about the big data. So if you, if you hold back some data, the machine cannot be as good, right? So it will lose some precision by holding back data. But it almost uses like almost uses, it almost loses any precision, right? From 85.3 to 84.7. However, the bias you cut by tenfold. So we can, and this is a, a subdiscipline, it's called well, algorithmic bias studies here, machine behavior. And people do these algorithmic audits in order to see like how does the machine behave and how can we optimize the machine? And that becomes a very important field in order to align the machine with human values, the, the important AI alignment field. And especially, I just put it as an example in unsupervised learning because don't leave the machine completely unsupervised, right? You, you need to kind of like make sure that there is, you know, something there because we also wanna, we don't, look at, we do not want, the machine learning paradigm basically says that we will be locked in the past forever because we feed it on data from the past. Now, we need to make sure that, it, we don't wanna repeat the past forever. We want a past that is better, that is different. So therefore, we need to make sure that we also align that a little bit. Okay, we have to talk more about that, but basically what I wanted to tell you, so with regard to the goal, and I'll tell you this or that goal, I tell you there are three big families of goals, supervised learning, reinforcement learning, and unsupervised learning. And here, you can pause the video and read through it, please. These are some different definitions. So basically in supervised learning, the machine learns an existing classification, something that we know and we want to automate, difference between cars and motorcycles, and we just, the machine learns to put things into buckets under our supervision. Reinforcement learning, we give the machine just an objective, a goal. We say gain points or whatever, make the world a better place and then give good advice. But then the machine will optimize for that in the landscape. And we might want to fine tune that. That's when we give human feedback in order to fine tune the goal. So make sure there are no unintended consequences when the machine implements a goal. And then unsupervised learning, where the machine basically, it's a data mimicry. It's a mimicry of the mathematical representation. So I have some kind of mathematical representation, and that can be a neural net or a Markov model, uh, and then, or a regression. And then I say, you know, from this regression versus the Markov model, you can, you, you try to fit the data best you can within the, in the parameters of this, of this family of model. You try to mimic the data in order to fit a pattern. But I still give it a goal. I still give it the kind of pattern I want to optimize for. I can optimize for a line or for a curve. Now that matters. Right. So you try to mimic the mathematical representation of it and uh, try to mimic a, a pattern. Now, again, also here, it's important that you kind of like, you know, at the end, you fine tune it to make sure there are no unintended uh, consequences. All right. So we did the data with the goal output. Now we need the algorithm. That's the last part of our machine learning excursion. And the algorithm is actually what we all do it for. The algorithm is to find well, optimal ways. <laughs> new ways, the best ways, whatever you might call that, uh, of doing things. So for example, if you ask the algorithm uh, to make the perfect drawing, you say, a girl stood in the blossoming Sunset Valley, pondering the mountains in the distance, peaceful pastel palette and matte painting. Then this, according to this database, is the optimal implementation of that description. That's what 
the algorithm computed. Or if you ask the algorithm to compute a Google soup, uh, that's what you get. Right? And we have a lot of these models right now. And the very, so this is examples of generative AI. It generates new ways of doing things. And I started this lecture already with ChatGPT. So here's another example. We can also just basically ask ChatGPT instead of me talking about in this lecture, let's just let ChatGPT lecture. What is actually, let's ask it. Um, what is this machine learning stuff uh, all about? So that's what it says. Machine learning is a method of data analysis that automates analytical model building. It's a branch of artificial intelligence based on the idea that systems can learn from data, identify patterns, and make decisions with minimal human intervention. There are three main types of machine learning. Supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning, and reinforcement learning. The ChatGPT must have watched my lecture. Before I recorded it, <laughs> it must have learned from data. Before. Okay, well, that is, that's a little bit too intelligent for me. So yeah, um, wrapping this up, look, the algorithm is so important because at the end, once the machine, once the master algorithm, the machine learning computed the best algorithm, we will use this best way of doing things in running our business and solving our problems. So for example, when a social media company has looks for goals, it says, well, I have data input, I have you know, people, what they do online, what they like or might not like, I have the news, I have their friends and so forth, and I have to compute some goal outputs. And that's like, I'm a company, so per definition, the goal output is to make money. And then I ask the algorithm, what's the best way of doing that? So persuasive technology is recommender algorithms, for example, as an application, is the outcome, what I compute here is the best way to capture people's attention. In a, a later lecture on social media in a later session, we will talk about that in a later course. So here you can see how actually social media algorithms use machine learning in order to create recommender algorithms that then fulfill their business mission, converting social networks well into financial output. So that's the goal of what we're doing, be computing the algorithm in order then later on use it in order to run our business or go about our things. And that is why machine learning has become the driving force of current social change. Machine learning looks for the best way, for new ways, for more efficient, for safer, for whatever, you, for other ways of doing things. It computes the algorithm itself.